I call this meeting of the Human Services Policy Committee to, meeting to order. Members, please take your seats. We do have a quorum, and the first item of business is the approval of the minutes from February 6, 2023. Excuse me, February 1st of 2023. Um, uh, I'm looking for a motion. Who would like to make the motion? I will make that motion. Oh. Representative Backer moves that the minutes from February 1st, 2023 be approved. Are there any questions or amendments? Hearing none, all in favor of the uh, approving the minutes from February 1st, 2023, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We've got three bills on our agenda for today. First, we'll be having House File 339 from Representative Coran. So, Representative Cran, if you'd like to move up to the testifiers table there, and uh, and I know you have a little bit of a script there, I'll let you sit down. Uh, Representative Cran, would you like to move your bill and proceed with your presentation? Uh, yes, I would, Chair, thank you. So, so Representative Cran moves to refer House File 339 to the Human Services Finance Committee. Uh, and I see you have testifiers. If you'd like to start off with a little uh, with your presentation, and then we can go to your testifiers, and then we'll go to questions. Representative Coran. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Fisher and committee members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity pr to present this bill, HF 339. Uh, this bill removes an unnecessary requirement for a separate license uh, for community residential service providers who want to support people um, using assistive technology during overnight hours. Um, this bill is being brought forward by ARM. It's a trade association of residential service providers, and they provide uh, service to people with disabilities through the different disability waivers. Uh, ARM members know that utilizing all tools, including assistive technology, can solve not only uh, service delivery needs, but also utilize the direct support professional staff in the most efficient way possible. We've heard from our constituents about the crisis that's worsening uh, day by day for individuals that access supports through a waiver service provider. Uh, with direct support professional vacancy rates exceeding 30%, uh, providers are working week by week and day by day, and I can attest uh, often hour by hour in my previous position prior to coming to legislature. Um, and people, we wanna make sure that people are um, being supported safely and that all shifts are covered. The language in front of you uh, removes an unnecessarily unnecessary requirement that provides um, that providers obtain a separate license to support people utilizing different forms of assistive technology during the overnight hours, even when they're already using this type of technology during the day. Uh, our bill puts, um, puts in place new requirements to ensure safety when providing assistive technology supports directly into 245D, which is the statute that regulates uh, waiver providers, uh, regardless of time of day. By doing this, we remove a barrier of providers getting a separate license, uh, streamlining processes, and reducing administratively duplicative uh, requirements. Um, beyond the need uh, that we're aware of to um, pay more for direct support professionals um, to help them, this will help with um, the chronic staffing shortage. Um, we have to look for common sense fixes that break down barriers and allow uh, creative, safe solutions to support people in a manner that they would like to be supported. Uh, I feel that this bill does just that, and I ask for your support. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my testifiers. Very good. Um, I see that we have our first testifier up here. Would this be Sarah Grafstrom? If you'd like to introduce yourself to the committee and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. For the record, my name is Sarah Grafstrom, and I am the Director of State and Federal Policy with ARM. We are an association dedicated to leading the advancement of home and community-based services and supporting over 130 residential providers across the state. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of House File 339, a bill that removes the requirement for providers to obtain a separate license or variance when supporting people through assistive technology during the overnight hours in a community residential setting and instead inserts new remote overnight supervision language directly into 245D, the law that governs the licensure of waiver service providers. The requirement of a separate license for AOST uh, went into place about 15 years ago established by a small working group of both providers and department staff who were tasked with getting this new technology off the ground. At that time, the utilization of technology to support people with disabilities was a new concept. Think about any piece of technology in your life and how it has changed in 15 years. 
We know that technology is a critical part of the services we provide to people with disabilities that can help promote independence and be a resource in a time of growing worker shortages. We have seen the use of technology grow. We have seen the technology available drastically improve. Um, my colleague Elena Gallagher is here and she'll share more details on that piece in a moment. Yet despite this change and improvement, the requirements put in place over 15 years ago remain the same. I wanna just take a quick moment to share a success story that one of our members recently shared with me. Um, at a home in northern Minnesota, four gentlemen have lived together for a few years and they have had direct support staff 24-7. The gentlemen were interested in being more independent and the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team, say that when you have a cold, um, their IDT and the men living in the home agreed to try using overnight remote supports. As the team worked to implement remote supports, it was felt that the on-site staff would need to come into the house around 7 a.m. so that the men could be assisted with waking up, getting breakfast, and getting ready for the day. This had always been something the staff supported the men with, and the team thought they would continue to need this support first thing in the morning. Within the first week of remote supports for overnight being implemented, the men surprised the staff by getting up on their own, getting breakfast on their own, and helping each other when they needed it. In fact, the men in the home proceeded to tell the staff they had it covered and did not need help. The men proudly spoke about doing these tasks and the morning staff reported that the guys were not only being more independent in their morning routines, but as they continued to use the remote supports, their confidence in being able to do things on their own grew. The men now proudly talk about having remote supports at night and enjoy showing new staff how the technology works and how they use it when, needing, when needed. Expanding the use of AOST helps support further independence. I know this committee has heard about the catastrophic workforce crisis within disability services. We have 38% of our DSP positions open and providers are making difficult decisions every day to close or consolidate homes or reduce capacity in the homes they currently support. The use of remote supports in CRS homes has allowed providers to relocate existing staff to homes that need the staff in-house on the overnight. And in some cases, remote supports have helped homes remain open where due to the staffing shortages, they may have been in danger of closure. Expanding the use of AOST is a workforce solution. Requ requiring a separate AOST license is an unnecessary barrier to supporting people with assistive technology and is duplicative to other rules and regulations that providers must follow, including 245D, monitoring technology usage policies, and the department's federally approved remote support policy. The use of technology is an underused tool and removing this duplicative requirement will help expand the use of this service, promote independence, and relieve some of the pressure providers have in filling overnight shifts, freeing up staff to provide important support services during the day. With that, I will stop and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Ms. Elena Gallagher, to share more of the details about what we mean when we talk about assistive technology, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Ms. Elena Gallagher. If you'd like to come forward, introduce yourself, who you're with, and then start your testimony, please. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. For the record, my name is Elena Gallagher, and I'm an exec executive project manager working with ARM to promote education about assistive technology and remote support through the state-funded innovation grant. I'm very excited that you guys are taking the time to hear both Sarah and I speak on behalf of HF339. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about technology, a subject that I am personally very passionate about because I've seen firsthand what a significant impact it can have on the lives of the individuals we serve. Assistive technology, enabling technology, and monitoring technology refer to the types of technology that can be used to help individuals live more independently with less reliance on staff. A combination of all three technologies can be used to provide alternative overnight supervision, allowing individuals in community residential settings the opportunity to safely have alone time without staff present, while still ensuring that they receive the care and support that they require. The technology that is set up will depend on the individual's specific needs and will be determined during the conversation and planning process prior to implementing the technology. Assistive technology offers a wide range of technology, ranging from low-tech to high-tech options. 
For example, a low-tech option could be a simple plastic grabber, you know, the ones with the claws, <laughs> which can be used to help someone who is bedbound pick up an item off of the floor that may have dropped. A high-tech option may be an automatic medication dispenser that will ad administer medication during the scheduled time and prompt the individual so they remember to take their medication. These are just two of many options of assistive technology that can be used overnight in place of requiring staff. Enabling technology can sometimes be an umbrella term that refers to both assistive technology and monitoring technology combined. In this bill, it also specifies that enabling technology means a device capable of live two-way communication or engagement between a resident and direct support staff at a remote location. The most common example of two-way communication devices are tablets that allow two-way video calls between the individual and the remote support staff that is providing the alternative overnight supervision. Through the two-way calling, both the individual and the remote support staff can initiate or request a call during the hours of support, ensuring that the appropriate support can be delivered and if additional assistance is needed, the individual can reach the remote staff for help. Monitoring technology is any equipment used to oversee, monitor, and supervise the individual by remote caregiver. Common examples of monitoring technology are sensors that can be placed around the house in appropriate areas that will indicate if the individual may need assistance or may be doing something that requires intervention. For example, in cases where elopement may be a concern, door sensors are placed on any of the doors that have access to the outside. These sensors can be linked to cameras that are used to watch the doors. So if the door is opened when it is not supposed to be, the remote support professional can see video of who opened the door and determine if there was an elopement risk or possibly if someone was just ordering a pizza. Other examples of monitoring technology can be motion sensors, pressure pads, buttons to get assistance, medication technology, or smartwatches that have emergency alert options or geofencing capabilities. The examples I provided of the different types of technology are just a few of many, many options that can be utilized to help an individual remain safe without staff in the home. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to these examples and potential ways they can be used to provide support to an individual in place of staff overnight. By removing the requirement for a provider to obtain additional licensing to provide alternative overnight supervision in community residential settings, you'll be opening up the opportunity for many more individuals to gain control of their lives and live independently. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Uh, we do have questions, so we'll start off with, uh, uh, well, before I go to questions, I just have to check, is there anyone else from the public who would like to testify? Hearing none, we'll move on to members' questions and comments. Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Grant, for bringing this forward. It's a good bill. Um, and uh, uh, to have us hear the words of streamlining and making things more simple is not heard along here a lot. Uh, and I appreciate those, and I appreciate the work of the bill. Um, and uh, I, Mr. Chair, what is the pathway for this bill? Is this, is this, there's no fiscal impact. Is this going right to the registry or what's the plan? My understanding is that it's going to the finance committee. There must be some, uh, and I'll refer to our CA, uh, Nick Strumo Langer here. Thank you. Uh, Chair Fisher, Representative Baker, yes, this will be going to Human Services Finance. A fiscal note has been requested for it in case there are costs associated with changing the, uh, the licensing here. Oh, thank you uh, for that. I just, uh, I hope that's either n none or minimal because I'd like to get this to the House floor and get it passed right away. So I think it's a great bill. I'm happy to support it when it comes along and um, thank you very much for bringing it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Uh, Representative Edelson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative. Listen, I agree with Representative Baker. I'm very supportive. The one uh, question, and you might have said it, um, we, we hear a lot of bills and a lot of things, so I, I, I might have missed it. But on 7.31, if physical presence, well, actually, sorry, 7.29 of the bill, if physical presence is needed, um, that you would be allowed the resident's maximum permissible time response, what is that? How much, how much time would that be? Represent, Representative Cran. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question. Um, and if you look just above that in 7.25 and 2.6, um, each individual support plan would determine what that maximal, 
uh, maximum allowable response time would be for that person. Um, so that really, it, it ensures safety, but it ensures safety that's particular to that person um, so that we're not, you know, giving any sort of unnecessary um, boundaries um, around that person's independence. Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative. That's actually, I love the individual um, look at that. And then just so, um, just one more follow up on that. Um, if there are differences in time where all the residents live in the home, but there's different times with each resident, how would that be managed? Representative Curran. Um, I could have uh, Ms. Grafstrom uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that the service, it would, it, in that situation may depend on who it is in the home um, that would need to have a physical presence. Um, and of course it might depend on the, the emergency of the situation. Certainly um, in an emergent situation, we wouldn't be looking at um, maximum um, allowable response times. Um, we would be deferring to emergency uh, management plans within the provider's home. Um, anything to add? Director Grafstrom. Uh, thank you, Chair Fisher and Representative Edelson. No, you, you got it right. It, everyone can have their own personal plan and so if I'm supporting someone that has a 20 minute support time and something happens within that person then they're going to be there within that emergency time that they need to be um, and if you want more details we do have providers here as well that are happy to share any more details with you. Representative Adelson. I think um, Rep Representative Cran answered my uh, answer my question quite well and it's, it's nice coming from a police officer that we, we can talk about this you know all about response times. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Uh, thank you, Representative Edelson. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Graham, for bringing this bill forward. My simple question is about the data privacy, you know, because we are collecting data going back and forth through technology. Uh, have we addressed that? I haven't seen direct reference to that. And also, I'm excited that we can use uh, robots in terms of helping individuals uh, get engaged. So, just wanted to know more about the data privacy elements uh, when it comes to using technology. Representative Coran? Uh, yes, I'll defer to our testifier for the answer to that. Okay, hi, we've got a new person with us. If you'd like to introduce yourself, welcome to committee. Hi, and my name is Kathy Neshaim Larson, and I uh, work with Civita, and I'm the Director of Remote Support and Assistive Technology for Civita. So in regards to data privacy, we work um, individually with each one of our providers that we're using for remote supports and they have a data privacy set up in regards to how they collect the information hold and store the data so um, there is right now um, uh, some things that are written in legislatively that uh, have us need to um, keep that data for five days and then up to 30 days if we necessarily need that and that's only for recorded data for a video of some sort so we, at this point, um, the rest of the data that we might be collecting is held the same way we do with anything else regarding, you know, HIPAA laws and, and confidentiality. Representative Knorr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to see that we put more strength in the language here so that we can protect the data that we're collecting because we're collecting massive information sometimes. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Okay, and this will be coming to your committee, so we'll be able to take a look at the language when it gets there. <laughs> Uh, next, I have uh, uh, any further questions of Representative uh, Chair Noor? Any uh, other questions? Nothing else, Mr. Okay, thank, thank you. you so uh, Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I apologize. I walked in a little bit late. <clears throat> While I see this as a plus, um, <clears throat> I've experienced it as a negative um, with a family member, um, and um, I've watched elopements happen um, in a nursing home that has not, they've not figured it out that she's gone. Um, and I realize we're talking 20 years ago, so I know that things have changed considerably. Um, but my concern is that when we're monitoring someone as well as the privacy issue is that we're actually catching, um, I worry about relying so much on technology that somebody could be sick or have a problem and we're not seeing it directly. So it's not that I don't support this. I'm more concerned about the response time of somebody being hurt or injured or sick um, or just trying to do something that they really shouldn't have done and they end up on the floor or whatever, you know. Um, and I, so my question would be is, 
how how will you how do you catch um, issues that are going on within a private setting? Representative Coran. Uh, yes, if our testifier has the answer. Okay, please go ahead, ma'am. Yes. Um, so in regards to um, catching the particular issues that might come up, um, we must go back and understand that before we'd implement any technology, we do a very thorough needs assessment to see what the needs are on the overnight. And then we take a close look at what, if I had a live staff there, what would that staff person do? How would they know that something was going on? And then we set up the technology devices that are specific to that person for what we might want to be um, uh, noticing and, and finding out about. So is it that I'm concerned somebody would get up in the middle of the night and maybe fall? You know, maybe they fall in their bedroom, go into the restroom, something like that. So there are uh, motion detectors and fall detectors that we can utilize in those rooms to be able to monitor those types of things. We also may decide we want to have um, a particular device around their neck that can indicate if they've fallen. Um, but all of this that we set up in regards to technology is individualized for each person and what their potential needs are, as well as in backup systems and supports for that. So the remote support companies that we might be using are going to be kind of our first line of intervention. Um, that's the staff person that's there. So that's our first line. So when we look at what would staff do versus what is the technology going to do, we try to um, get them to match as much as possible. Um, and, and that's how we address and look at the needs for the individual. Representative Keel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, it just, um, my experience is it just got missed because everybody was so busy that, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it, um, that's my concern is that we catch right. those things because family might be really right. um, reliant on that. And then I can see the conversations we had earlier about nursing homes and safety that family would say, how come this person died because nobody came? And, and, and it'll ha it could happen anyway, I get that. But um, just concerned about those issues so thank you so and actually might I add that um, in regards to technology what we're finding is that um, some of the pieces of technology can make uh, is much better than actually having a physical person there so some of the technology around seizure detection things like that that we try to utilize um, for individuals who have that need uh, we'll know in the moment that potentially somebody is having a seizure as opposed to maybe a staff goes in and checks every two hours. We're only going to know if they're having a seizure if we happen to catch it during that two hour period of time. So in some instances having technology is actually much better than having a person wandering throughout the house checking on people and for the individuals that we're serving it actually is much better for them and that they actually get a better night's sleep. So you know nobody's opening the door every couple hours just to check in on them which mm -hmm. would wake everybody up. So it allows them to have a much better night's sleep. So we look individually at what's going to work for the person. And then the team signs off on that as far as approving that and the response time you asked about as well. Um, that's a decision made in regards to the individual's needs. Thank you. In, okay. All right. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, Representative Cran, would you like to offer closing comments and renew your motion on House File 339? Uh, yes, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, I won't go through uh, the entire details again, but just for this committee, I know we've already learned a lot from um, departments and uh, through other bills and issues that we have a significant workforce shortage, especially when it comes to caring for our neighbors with disabilities. Um, in the, in, at the same time, we want to make sure that we're promoting independence um, for people of all different abilities. And I think um, this bill why it might be um, just... A simple way to do just that. Um, I, I think it's a really neat thing that we can do for folks. Um, it's person-centered, um, and it offers a bit, you know, um, a bit more dignity um, in life. Being able to promote one's own dependence um, and perhaps um, learn to navigate the world in different ways um, that being around um, people 24/7 might hinder that process. So, um, with that, um, yes, I would like to renew my motion um, on House File 339. Representative Cran renews her motion to refer House File 339 to the Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed say nay. The motion prevails and House File 339 is referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. Thank you to our testifiers for being here today. Thank you, Representative Cran, for the bill.
Our next item of business is House File 716 from Representative Finky. Finky. Uh, Representative Finke, would you like to move your bill and proceed with your presentation? I would. Representative uh, Finke moves to refer House File 716 to the Human Services Finance Committee. If you'd like to go ahead and start your, your presentation, please. Thank you very much, Chair Fisher and members. Um, House File 716 aims to remove some of the barriers people face uh, people with disabilities face in living in their own homes. In 2021, the legislature adopted a framework in Minnesota that individuals with disabilities should get to make an informed choice about where they live, and that people should have the option to choose to live in their own homes rather than congregate or other provider-controlled settings. We have come a long way in this work, but people who want to live in their own homes continue to face many barriers, and the direct care workforce shortage is making it even more difficult. When people live in their own homes, they have more autonomy over their lives and more options for being a part of their community. It is vital that we uphold our promise to people with disabilities that they will have choice in where they live and that we are committed as a state to inclusive policy in our society and to making inclusive policy for our society and offering choice in how people and where people can live. Uh, HF 716 would remove barriers to people choosing to live in their own homes, particularly amidst the current pressing direct care workforce shortage. So this bill does four things. First, it expands options for people who live in their own home to share services. This is an important option that would permit more people who live together when they fully agree to share service providers for support that they need. This is a workforce shortage solution that would allow more people to be supported by less staff while also remaining in their own homes and communities. The bill also makes three changes related to individual home supports with training, IHSTs. For many individuals living in their own home, IHST is a critical service to stabilizing their housing and remaining in their communities. The changes to IHST include allowing the unit of service to be either one hour or 15 minutes, this change would benefit individuals that live in their own homes and may need service for longer periods of time during the day. Providers have shared that providing upwards of eight hours of service and billing through 15 minute units causes administrative challenges. Allowing this option would streamline things on the back end and have no impact on the flexibility and the way people access service. The bill would also allow for indirect billing for IHST. While it is always the first option to directly support individuals accessing services in their goals, there are instances when a staff may need to follow up or coordinate on the client's behalf with their consent. This is a flexibility that would ensure workers can best support people accessing services and the type of tasks that help them maintain living in their community. Lastly, this would allow for out-of-state billing for IHST. Currently, CDCS and some home care services have this flexibility, but as you will hear from one of our testifiers today, people who want to temporarily go out of state with their IHST staff are not allowed to. It is important that people with disabilities can choose who they are supported by if they travel. Finally, I want to note that we are in the midst of drafting an author's amendment for this bill. Uh, we've been in conversations with, and I offer my great thanks to Representative Hicks for those discussions, and we are working with Department of Human Services for technical assistance and language to ensure that changes are operational and that we can obtain CMS approval. We will be working diligently with the department to get this bill in good shape and bring it forward, and bring forward an amendment in human services finance. Now I will turn it over to my first testifier, Steve Schmidt, who will be reading testimony of individuals who are not able to access our hearing virtually due to the technological limits of this building. Thank you, Representative Finke. Uh, Stephen, Sch Stephen Schmidt, if you'd like to introduce yourself and start your testimony, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Stephen Schmidt. I'm a supervising attorney at Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid and Minnesota Disability Law Center. 
And with their permission, I will be reading uh, the written testimony of my former client's parents in regard to the changes to individualized home supports in this proposal. We are Dennis and Susan Kane, parents of Hannah Kane. Having grown up in the 1960s and being peripherally aware of the state institutions, one of the many fears we had upon realizing the gravity of our daughter Hannah's disability was, like all parents, where and how would she live after we were no longer able to care for her. This concern was supplanted by many, many more pressing and immediate concerns as she and we negotiated the doctors, therapy, and educational systems and so many other challenges as she grew to become the vibrant, outgoing young lady we know today. Many hurdles, both expected and unforeseen, have been encountered and dealt with, but now we find ourselves facing head-on in very real time that initial fear of what is going to become of her after we are gone. One of, if not our biggest concern, which we thought we had dealt with for now, is housing. Hannah lives in her home of her own. We planned and worked hard to save and pay for this home. She has staff that come in to assist her with essential life functions and assure she is safe. To accomplish this staffing, we were forced to switch from the DD waiver using CDCS to DD waiver using IHS supports. One of the unintended consequences of this change is the reason for bringing this to the attention of the legislature. We have discovered that according to the current state statute, Hannah cannot get the support staff she needs if she vacations out of state. Previous to this change, she was able to sta be bring staff with her when she traveled, and she was free to travel with staff with or without her family. We always paid for her and her staff's travel expenses. The waiver paid for wages for staff via CDCS, the same as they would if she was simply sitting on her own couch in her home. We request the statute be amended. Our wish is for Hannah to be able to travel to visit her many cousins and friends that we have fostered relationships with throughout her life now and in the future. When we are no longer living, it is our goal to have these relationships to help her added natural, help her give, help give her added natural supports only achievable by being able to travel. It seems obvious the IHS program was missed, as most of all the other DD waiver programs allow out-of-state travel. Frankly, the way the law is worded, IHS disallows Hannah to go to Wisconsin for lunch with her staff, which is at 10 minutes from her Minnesota home. In short, our fear and our greatest concern will be that she is trapped in her own home, just as in previous generations she may have been trapped in an institution. We do not believe that was the intent of the law when it was written, and indeed contradicts the freedom to travel freely that we all take for granted. Instead, it discriminates against people with disabilities living in their own homes to travel with the support they need. We respectfully request the law be amended so that Hannah and all of her peers can live the life they deserve, travel if they wish with support staff, and not be restricted by any of the other waiver programs. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Brittany Wilson. Brittany would like to come forward and offer her testimony, please. Hi, Brittany. Welcome to the committee. Great to see you. Please introduce yourself. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to testify on this bill. My name is Brittany Wilson. I live in St. Paul and am employed as the Equity and Justice Director for the ARC Minnesota. However, I'm here today to testify as a disability advocate. I was born with a disability and have been on wavered services for as long as I can remember. I also rely on in-home services to live independently in my home. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to everyone here, but finding caregivers, especially during this pandemic, has been very difficult. I, like so many folks, struggle every day to face the very real reality that this life we have worked so hard for could crumble at any moment. I'm down to one staff, and in a year or two, I'll need to find a new place to live because my rent will rise to a level I can no longer afford. So much of our future feels like it's in limbo right now. We need multiple solutions for folks if we're going to survive. And that's why I urge you to support House File 716, because it allows for shared services across disability waivers so that we can live in our own homes where we choose, with people that we choose, whether it be a roommate, a sibling, a friend, a lover, a partner, a spouse, and share the same staff. If this passes, people in our community, including myself, could provide a pathway to finding more accessible housing and sustainable home care. 
If I can search for a place to live and include more income streams, my options will open up. If I can live with other people with disabilities who need, who need similar services to me, and we can use our support, support plan and shared service agreements to collectively get the support that we all need, it would be life-changing. Part of the reason disabled folks, well really everyone here, <laughs> have survived historically is through interdependence, by relying on one another to have our needs met. And in my opinion, this bill allows for that by creating a pathway for folks in our community to live with others, to be able to live and thrive. And it will cost less than institutionalizing people in high level care facilities. This change would bring some much needed flexibility to our waiver system. We are facing one of the largest direct care work workforce and affordable accessible housing shortages. I am losing count of how many people I know who are being forced into high level care facilities that they do not need in order to get their basic needs met. I am losing track of people that I love who are having their autonomy stolen because they have no other choice. Just yesterday, I had a call from a self advocate uh, calling to explain to me that they've been given two weeks to find a different place to live because where they currently live cannot provide the care that this person needs. Her tearful response was, Brittany, if I have to be homeless, I will die. What do I say to her? She won't have, she doesn't want to give up her autonomy to survive and I understand, neither would I, would you? This bill also makes improvements to individualized home supports with training to increase flexibility with how someone can be supported. IHST provides integrated community supports that make life meaningful for people. This kind of flexibility will provide, again, a pathway for people in our community to live a life that they want in the least restrictive environment. And it allows for greater flexibility for those who are supporting us too. It helps humanize this service because we are human beings and life happens. We need a system that recognizes this and plans for it. It is your duty to hear the citizens of our state who are in need of help. We have been begging for decades. Who have been, so we have been sounding the alarms in our service system and saying that we need other options, options that are viable, that mean we get to choose the life in the home of our choosing. Please allow me to remind you that this really is the bare minimum. Asking for the choice to live in our own homes is the bare minimum. Thank you, Representative Finke, for carrying this bill, and thank you so much to everyone for hearing my testimony today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson, for your testimony and for sharing with us today and reminding us how important this is. Uh, uh, before I go to members, I just want to check, is there anyone else from the public that would like to testify on this bill? Hearing none, I will now move to our members. Representative Keel, you are first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> You know, uh, this sounds like a, 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 an adapt, adaption for people that need services if there's two in a home. Um, but my concern would be is um, when Brittany explained, you know, you might be with a friend or I think about college and how you're living with somebody and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it doesn't work for one person, you have a personality clash. But how would you um, work the 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 uh, shared services and then the split. How would that, does the bill account for that? I'm not sure if I missed it or whatever. Representative Finke, are we, we're phoning a friend here. We're phoning a friend. I have experts right. here to answer these questions. But. Certainly. If you'd like to come forward, introduce yourself, who you're with, and uh, proceed with answering the question. Welcome to the committee. Thank you. Uh, Julia Page, Public Policy Director for the ARC Minnesota. Uh, Chair Fisher, Representative Keel, are you referring to the financial split specifically? Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I would be uh, concerned about both, the financial, but also the care for that individual as they part. How would all that work? If they were to, um, excuse me, Mr. Chair, uh, Representative, if they were to no longer live together. So there, there is language in the bill um, specifically about consenting to living in this setting and also con 
having the right to um, move out and stop sharing services at any given time. Um, so that is part of the language, making sure that people have that ability to, to change um, their services and no longer live there. So then they would obviously navigate that with maybe their case manager or their other support team to find a way to do that split in a seamless way. Representative Keel. Okay, so the other concern I would have is two people in a place. Um, would there be a balance in the care that each, each individual would need so that we make sure that somebody isn't not getting what they need? Um, is that, how would that work? Ms. Page. Um, uh, Chair Fisher, Representative Keel, um, it would all be a part of their support plan, uh, or their care plan, working with their, their support teams, either case managers or the providers themselves to ensure how they would split that. Um, and those folks, again, are, are consenting to being a part of sharing services, so it would be understood. Um, you know, For some folks, while they maybe need to access the same service, they may have more hours uh, for one particular service than another. Um, so that would all be, of course, like accounted for in how they would uh, adjust to, to serving those folks and their needs. Uh, Representative Finke. Um, I appreciate that technical support answer and I would also just answer that uh, people have roommates, people have partners, um, sometimes we live together, sometimes we break up and we move out. Sometimes those things happen, it's a part of being a person and making your own autonomous decisions and uh, I don't see a reason that all of those life experiences and decisions should somehow not be available to people with disabilities because of complexities to their care. Representative Keel. Thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. Um, and and uh, Representative Finke, I wouldn't be questioning that. I just, things get a little messy when you have uh, government services, when you have all of these things, um, just because of relationships and making sure that, that it's all, uh, that we're doing it right for everyone so that nobody's left in the dust or, you know, has doesn't have the support that they would need. So that's that's why I was asking. I, you know, I get I get that that's part of personalities, but breakups are also part of personalities. So that's yeah. Representative Pinky. Yes, and to be clear, that's that's a good and important question. I just want to also um, bring back that autonomy uh, element to what we're we're talking about. Totally understand the question. Thank you, and Ms. Page. Uh, Chair Fisher, Representative Keel, I just want to point out too that right now people are living together and are accessing services. Um, they just have to have separate workers. And so um, this would be a cost savings way um, to address this workforce shortage while also ensuring people's autonomy and where they can live. Thank you. Uh, next I have Representative Hicks. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Thank you for bringing this forward. Um, and thank you for the work that we're doing on the author's amendment. Um, just always top of my mind to make sure that we are making sure the person is always at the first first thought and continued through. Um, I just wanted to say thank you, and then I also just wanted to say I've seen some of these these um, creative solutions over the years, and the thing that has always stuck out to me, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is how personal the plans are. How everyone's just because you're my roommate doesn't mean that I know exactly what's in your plan or you know what's in my plan we're sharing support and sharing our life at the level that we choose not um, crossing over some of those boundaries and so I just I assume that this would continue that way people would have roommate meetings when it's appropriate but it, there wouldn't be any privacy concerns or issues around that is that correct uh, and uh, Ms. Page. Uh, Chair Fisher, uh, Representative Hicks, yes. Um, again, a part of that consent uh, to share services, it would be all be a part of that discussion in terms of you know privacy and wh where the boundaries are. Absolutely. Okay, Representative uh, Hicks, anything else? No, that's it. I just, I love this so much and I wanted to make sure because I know many members of this committee and, and also in the Finance Committee always have privacy concerns. So I thought I would ask the question and make sure we were settled there. Okay, seeing no other uh, comments or questions, Representative Binky, would you like to make closing comments and renew your motion on House File 716? I would, thank you, Chair. Fisher, um, I just wanna reiterate something that Brittany Wilson said, which is that um, we need multiple solutions to this problem. This is a, we are trying to solve very vast um, and very deep issues in our systems, and this is one good option that gives people more choices over how they live, who they live with, 
and what services they need. And it continues to make sure that um, we don't leave people in limbo for their future as they face uncertainty around their housing. Um, anything that we can do to, to add security and not make people put a choice between autonomy and health and safety against each other, that's no choice at all. So thank you very much for hearing this and I renew my motion. Very good. Uh, Representative Finke renews her motion to refer House File 716 to the Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and House File 716 is referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. We will now move on to our final bill for the day. This will be from Representative Hicks. It will be House File 813. Representative Hicks, would you move your bill and proceed with your uh, presentation? Thank you, thank you, Chair, thank you, Committee. I move to refer House File 813 to Human Services Finance. Thank you, go ahead with your presentation and then I understand you have uh, testifiers that we'll go to after you're done. I do, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Before you today is House File 813, a bill brought forward, again, by ARM, the Trade Association for Residential Waiver Service Providers. The bill does two things. First, it would provide $1,000 for recruitment and retention bonuses for every one of the 30,000 direct support professionals currently working and incentivize an additional 13,000 individuals to join our workforce. Second, the bill provides $4 million in appropriation for deed to develop and implement a multi-pronged public awareness campaign aimed to bring employees into the caring professions, including DSPs, but also all of our caring professions, which we've heard are in dire need. We've heard over and over again in this committee about the catastrophic impact that the current workforce shortage is having on supporting people with disabilities. We know that group homes are closing, people living on their own are being left without services for long periods of time, sometimes ending up in the hospital, and that employment services have growing wait lists. We cannot ignore these issues. Direct support professionals have an unbelievably difficult job. I was a direct support professional for 19 years and understand the importance of that care. They do everything from administering medications, helping with money management, providing transportation, crisis intervention, supporting people with their intimate care needs, assisting with learning new life skills and supporting integrated competitive employment. Direct support professionals are there for the people they support during wonderful times and hard and scary times. They're there to celebrate and to support. And yet these critical staff make an average wage of just over $15 an hour. The vacancy rate is one of the highest in the state with over 30%. This impacts direct support professionals who don't leave by requiring them to work extra shifts or help out whenever they are needed. I've heard personal stories from friends who have worked 24 hours straight. We as a state need to show these valuable employees that they are seen and appreciated. We can do this through our long-term investments and through many of the bills that we've heard in this committee and in finance, and through one-time invest investments like this bill. Talk to any DSP and they will tell you that they, work, they do the work they do because of the people they get to support. We are losing these incredible staff because they cannot afford to stay in our profession. This legislation aims to help them out financially and at the same time, raise the profile of this incredibly rewarding profession. With that, I will turn it over to my testifiers to provide more information about the bill and the impact it will have. Good afternoon, we have Sarah Grastrom returning. If you'd like to once again introduce yourself for the record and begin your testimony. Yes, thank you Mr. Chair and committee members for the record. My name is Sarah Grastrom. I'm the Director of State and Federal Policy with ARM. Um, our members provide residential services through the four disability waivers. We support people living in many different settings from community residential settings to people's own home or family home to people living in an ICFDD. While each service is different and each home unique, they have one thing in common. Every service is on the verge of collapse because we don't have staff. I was recently talking to one of our members who shared with me the story of how he got started in the field. He shared that he started as a direct support professional while in college. He said he did not, he said he did not make a lot of money, but it was comparable to other jobs at restaurants or retail that he was considering. 
And through his position as a DSP, he was able to gain experience working with individuals with disabilities that ended up guiding him into his career in the field now. This member's story is no different than many that I talk to. How can we attract direct support professionals into our field when they are paid considerably less than similar jobs outside the field? What will the downstream impact be in two, five, or 10 years when we don't have experienced, skilled staff? The time to act is now. Another member recently shared with me that as an organization, they consistently have 40 to 50 open positions on a base fully staffed employee count of just under 200. These consistently open positions not only limit the amount of support and services the organization can provide, they have created an ongoing level of stress for all employees that is unhealthy and unsustainable. These employees have been asked to take on a rising workload with no, no foreseeable end in sight, causing the loss of experienced and valuable employees who choose to find other employment rather than work under these circumstances. House file 813 is one piece of the broader workforce solution. First and foremost, as Representative Hicks stated, we need to pass reimbursement increases that raise DSP wages, but we also need to show our current staff that they are valued and find new ways to bring them into the profession. House file 813 provides a $1,000 retention or recruitment benefit for every DSP across the state. We estimate that we currently have 30,000 DSPs in our workforce with a reported vacancy rate of over 30%, leaving approximately 13,000 DSP positions open. House file 813 also contains language that allocates $4 million to DEED to work with our stakeholders in launching a multi-year, multi-faceted public awareness campaign. Our goal is simple. We aim to attract workers into the caring professions. Modeled after a similar campaign that was launched in Ohio, we plan to tell stories in a variety of ways and mediums, including television, billboards, radio, social media, et cetera. You have heard over and over in various settings that our caring professions in Minnesota are experiencing severe workforce challenges. Providers continue to use all the tools in their toolbox, using job sites like Indeed, job fairs, and word of mouth, but it is not enough. What we are proposing with this appropriation is to take it up a notch in a big way. Make the caring profession something that people hear about on, a, on multiple platforms and can envision themselves participating in as a career. Our ultimate goal is having a broad-based public campaign to heighten the awareness of the caring professions and to attract new workers into the various health and human service sectors. The proposal calls for DEED to convene stakeholders as well as work with a creative service company to develop the right concept and zero in on the right platforms. Our initial ideas for content include focusing on high school graduates, a delivery person, a mother going back to work, et cetera. Throughout the PSA, you can get the sense that they are looking for a more meaningful career where they can help their fellow Minnesotans. We need to draw back the curtain and show why a career in the caring profession is rewarding, fulfilling, and something that is deeply appreciated. With that, I know we have other testifiers that can talk about the direct impact um, that they are seen in their communities, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Next, we have Cindy Ostrowalski. If you could please introduce yourself and who you're with, and then you could start your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you so much for your time today. My name is Cindy Ostrowski. I'm the CEO for Hiawatha Homes in Rochester, Minnesota. We provide home and community-based services to people throughout Olmstead County in residential support services and in unit-based out-of-home respite care services. We've been providing services for 46 and a half years. I am here today to ask you for your support and your commitment to people with disabilities in Minnesota and their direct support professionals. By investing in House File 813, you'll be helping recruit and retain our state's most valuable resources, our direct support professionals and frontline supervisors. By supporting House File 813, you will also be assisting with employment and economic development to help develop and implement awareness and building campaigns to recruit new direct support professionals to the field. 
The workforce crisis continues to be very real. You've heard that several times today, but it is very real. And it is drastically affecting the people we support. It's affecting people with disabilities in our community. And it's affecting how we provide services, the quality of our services, and how many people we can support throughout our community. Throughout the years, we have witnessed the number of direct support professionals decline significantly. In 2014, Hiawatha Homes employed 400 employees. 341 were direct support professionals. In 2018, we employed 303 employees, of whom 242 were direct support professionals. We ended the year in 2022 with only 254 employees, 198 were direct support professionals. Hiawatha Homes is just one of hundreds of providers who have been forced to close residential homes and or move people together in homes, thus reducing the number of people we can support in our community. Since 2018, we have closed three residential homes and consolidated individuals together, but still we've had to reduce the number of people we serve. Today, we are supporting 22 fewer people in residential homes than we did in 2014. Today, we are only able to support five individuals and families in our out-of-home respite care program instead of 30 to 35 people in our family support services program. Sadly, our respite home remains closed since March of 2020. With fewer direct support professionals, we have had to turn people away who need services. From January 1st to January 23rd of this year, we have had 10 people and families call waiting for services, looking for a residential home or looking for some respite care on the weekend for their loved ones. And we've had to say, I'm sorry, no, we cannot support you. We just do not have enough staff to help you. Each and every year, like many other um, providers, Hiawatha Homes works diligently to both recruit new team members and retain our team members. They're very skilled team members and they work very hard. But unfortunately, when other health care providers in our area or businesses raise their wages, our team members need to leave in order to care for themselves and better care for their families. In 2019, we hired 134 team members, yet 152 left. In 2020, we hired 154 new team members, yet 172 left. Overall that year, we lost eight employees, 18 employees. In 2021, we spent double our recruitment budget and we hired 191 team members and 180 left. In January 2022, although the state of Minnesota rolled out a new reimbursement rate of 16.33, minus the regional variance for our county, we increased our starting wages on May 29th of 2022 to $17 an hour for all new direct support professionals and $18.50 an hour for our DSP floats and our team leaders. In 2022, we implemented two appreciation and retention bonuses. This did help. We had a gain of nine direct support professionals for the year. Yet today, we are still in need of hiring at least 30 full-time DSPs. To help support our team members and to keep the people we support safe, we have been forced to hire contracted employees, which means a higher cost to provide services. Our direct support professionals, our floats, our team leaders, our house coordinators, our program managers, our nurses have all worked diligently to fill open hours. Yet our overtime hours continue to grow, forcing the cost of services once again higher. In 2021, our team members worked approximately 31,300 overtime hours. In 2022, our overtime hours were approximately 30,000 overtime hours. Con contracted hours and overtime hours are expensive. And like many other support providers across the state, Hiawatha Homes will be experiencing a significant budget deficit in 2023 just to continue to provide the service that we do today. 
We must all work together to value direct support professionals. We must all work together to retain direct support professionals and to grow the profession and to increase the number of direct support professionals in our workforce. Without our direct support professionals and frontline supervisors, we cannot provide quality services. We cannot provide person-driven services to people with disabilities across the state of Minnesota. Please hear us. Please join us in sending an important message and a well-deserved message to all direct care staff that they are valued, that they are appreciated for their dedication and hard work to others. Please help us preserve services to people with disabilities across our state of Minnesota. The time is now, our 2023 legislative session, to invest in House File 813 and stop the downward trend of highly skilled direct support professionals leaving this profession. We need to value our direct support professionals by investing in this workforce incentive grant program, and we need to increase the number of DSPs across our state. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for your service to Minnesota. Thank you for your testimony. Next we have Jasmine Fury, if you'd like to come forward. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and start your testimony, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. My name is Jasmine Fury, and I'm a supervisor at Bear Creek Services in a community residential setting. I started out as a DSP in 2007. Working with individuals with traumatic brain injuries, I found a career that I never knew I wanted. I didn't make a lot of money, but my job was rewarding. It's rewarding in ways that you and I have taken for granted. Working with an individual who loved the idea of baking, but didn't have the encouragement that she should, she cracked her first egg in her life with me. We're proud of the cupcakes that we made that day. What's better, she was proud of herself. We strive to assist individuals with all kinds of abilities with realizing they can do the things that they want. We just have to be creative. This is just one of the supports that suffers because we don't have the staff to support our individuals. I have worked countless 100-hour weeks both as a DSP and as a supervisor. There have been countless nights that I've missed dinner with my husband, or he's asleep when I get home, or nights that I don't even come home. There have even been instances where I look at my husband and tell him, I'll see you Wednesday afternoon when it's Sunday evening. Most everyone in this room has the ability to go home to their families at the end of the workday to share a meal or begin their day with their families and significant others. We don't always have that opportunity. We have lost countless employees in this field due to an overwhelming workload and zero work-life balance. Our jobs can be mentally and physically exhausting and we don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I've had a staff member share with me that her 17-year-old son made more money than she did at Walmart $15 an hour while she was just above 12. How is that fair? Our part-time employees are working full-time hours when they don't want these hours. They can't afford to have these hours because they have small children at home that they have to care for. This is something that we are facing every day. They are not saying no because they know just how much of a shortage that we are in. This bill will help show that the caring and compassionate individuals that we have working in this field, that we are valued. The work that we are doing matters. That we get to help and support, that we get the help and support that we need to be able to do our best work for the individuals that we serve. They are people too, and they deserve our best efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing what your, 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 your stories and your experiences with us. Thank you. You're welcome. Next we have Francis Tom. Uh, I don't know if I got the last name right, but please come forward. Welcome to the committee. Thank you for being here. Please introduce yourself, who you're with, and start your testimony, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Frances Cham. I'm a member of the Board of Directors 
for Residential Provider Association of Minnesota, or RPAMN. I'm here to testify today in support of HF 813 and the concept of recruitment and retention bonuses for home and community-based service and other disability service providers. RPAMN is a 501c6 nonprofit trade association that represents small residential customized living and waiver service providers in Minnesota. Our organization was formed in 2021 in response to a series of massive changes to the, like, to the regulatory and reimbursement landscape in which our members operated. Our PAMN has roughly over 200 providers, members, and subscribers, with vast majority being BIPOC owned, culturally specific service provider who might not otherwise be engaged in the policy development and legislative processes. The vast majority of our PAMN members were formed following the 2009 moratorium on new licensed community residential settings or CRS beds and serving clients in single family homes as either an MDH licensed home care company or in recent years as assisted living facility. However, in recent years, many RPA MM members have become licensed under the 245D to provide HCBS services like Integrated Community Support or ICS. Also, since 2021, other RPA MM members have sought 245D license to take advantage of the time limited exception to the CRM, CRS moratorium. While a substantial backlog in the DHS licensing division has caused extended delays in securing 245D licenses, our PAMM believes HF813, who supports many of its members as we seek to recruit and retain workers. Like others who have spoken before this committee, we continue to struggle to compete with large retailers and other organizations who because they are able to increase their prices, are able to offer higher wages and benefits to employees. It seems like as soon as we are able to hire someone and get them trained, we'll lose them to another provider. The, higher, the hard turnover increases our administrative costs, including fingerprint, background checks, and staff onboarding, and puts stress on existing employees to maintain or increase level of service. We hope that as the, as the legislative session advances, we can look at ways to ensure all types of disability service providers, including those culturally specific currently seeking 245D licenses, are able to secure support for their recruitment and retention efforts. Thank you for the time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else from the public that would like to testify on House File 813? <clears throat> Seeing none, we will go to uh, members' questions and comments. We'll start off with Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank the testifiers today. Um, this is uh, really um, a challenge. It's an issue. I, I, everybody who spoke today is spot on. They are not paid enough, that's the bottom line, and they're having a hard time, and this is an idea. Bills are ideas, right? And we wanna bring them here, and we wanna try to get them to work. As an employer myself, I've had bonus programs, and, and some have worked well, some have not. My question is, because this is a government program, I'm nervous how this is gonna get deployed, so I have a couple questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so to either the author or Sarah, um, are these checks gonna get distributed after somebody becomes eligible. Let's say an employee is gonna be with a provider for a minimum of X. And then what, what, just help me through that process of when do these folks get rewarded with a thousand dollar check? How long do they have to work? And then uh, I've got a few more follow-ups. Representative Hicks. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Baker. I will defer to our testifier. Director Grassroom. Thank you, Chair Fisher and Representative Baker. Great question. Um, you know, as we were crafting this legislation, our goal was really to try to make it flexible for both the employee and employer. So it might not even be a $1,000 check that they get. There's a variety of ways 
um, listed within this legislation of uses for the for the bill. So if you look on line 2.1 through um, 2.6, these are all acceptable ways to recruit and retain or recruit and retain employees. So it might be an incentive payment. It might be some kind of post-secondary tuition payment, child care costs. It's really kind of looking at the employer and looking at their employees and finding meaningful, meaningful ways to recruit and retain their employees. As far as a time, we don't have any time, you know, directly in the bill. Certainly happy to talk about ways that we might want to tighten this up or make the legislation work better going forward. Representative Baker. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, yep, I just, again, I think what's got to be tightened up and, and again, I, I worry about government agencies trying to do a bonus pro program and they really aren't the employer out in the field. They are a, a, a pass through, if you will. And it makes me nervous that we've got some bad players out there. And I'm saying that those are some bad employers that are going to want to, you know, tell you've got these 25 employees and they're here for this time. And how do we verify those employers are still on staff and how do we cross reference that? Uh, Representative Hicks. Yes, yeah, thank you. And thank you so much for the question. I do, I have a comment I want to answer and then I want to turn over to the testifier. So my first comment is you made a really good point in that you um, have concerns about a government entity sort of feeling it over. But unlike every other business, they don't have any other income. We are their only income stream. And since we have not increased rates, they don't have any other way to do this. They've, they've already depleted many of them, their foundations, they're taking out loans, right? There, there is no, there is no, we're gonna charge 50 cents more for a cup of coffee in the disability services world. And so I just sort of wanna lay the groundwork that this is different because of that. They are tied to us. And then as far as the um, audits and recruitment and attestations, yeah, those are on subdivision four and subdivision five. So there are some safety nets in here. I agree with you. We wanna make sure that we're using the taxpayers' dollars in the best way possible and that we are making sure that folks are being responsible with that and holding them accountable to that. Um, but I also understand that we have put providers in an impossible situation. And so trying to find an immediate solution, because although we have lots of solutions that I think are going to help us in 2024 and 2025 as we work through our larger budgets and our larger plans, we need to infuse now before we have a full systems collapse. Because if the system collapses, individuals will be in the hospital because there will not be anywhere else for them to go and we will be paying for that as well and there's a workforce shortage there. But we are, we are on the verge of collapse. And so I just wanna really stress that this, this isn't, I don't think how any of us would have liked to do this. I think we all would have liked to have rates that were fair and comparable and appropriate for the last, you know, that could meet the need and the changes in inflation and the changes in what our, our community needs. But that didn't happen. And so this is an attempt to put a solution in place now before a total collapse. And then Sarah, if you have anything And then add. Direct, uh, Dr Director Grafstrom. Chair Fisher, I, I don't think I can add anything to that. That was excellent, thank you. But I would just again point to the attestation and the audit language that we put in there in, a, in an effort to make sure that providers are saying, here are the number of eligible employees we have. Um, and then the audit that you know requires providers to keep records of how they use the funds, where the funds went, and giving the commissioner the appropriate authority to go back and ask for those records. Uh, Representative Baker. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Fish, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, and I agree with everything. I, I, I want all this money to go right to the employees. Mm -hmm. I don't. I think four million dollars is sort of ridiculous for a marketing plan when the best recruiters are current workers in those in those fields. They're the ones who are going to do this, and that four million should go to the workers. The forty-three million times two, eighty-six million dollars. We should get that to the employees by the by rates per hour. I think that's what we all want. It's easier said than done, Absolutely. and I get that. I just know that creating more agency, more stuff, more, you know, somebody else to manage this when we've got a lot of, of you know, uh, concerns of how do we manage the monies and the grants going out now from different agencies. So I just, we're creating something. I know these are ideas. I want the money to get to the employees desperately, just like our nursing homes, just like other folks that desperately need it now, and I just want people to hear us Let's get this fixed out right away. I, I worry that I worry the government pr 
programs are not the, the best answer. It's maybe the best other option we have, and I'm willing to work with the author of this to try to help tighten this thing up. I'm hearing that's what we have to do, but I, and I want to hold anybody accountable that's going to take one dollar for anything other than labor on this thing, whether it's providers or employers, whatever that is, because they can't do that. We have to make sure that everything goes there, but it's got to be streamlined. And again, um, there's just a lot of, lot of moving parts here. So uh, again, I appreciate the work because these workers really need it. And um, I just hope that we can find a faster way to get it to them in a, in a way that isn't so cumbersome and creates more work for deed and all that kind of stuff. But thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Representative Baker. And this will also be going to the Finance Committee where we'll spend more time on this and have an opportunity to look at other language we could put in to tighten things up a little bit. Uh, next, we have Vice Chair Frederick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Hicks, for carrying the legislation. Uh, I really appreciate your efforts in supporting workers because I think that's very clearly what this does. Uh, but it also supports the people who are receiving care from the workers, which I think is also awesome. Um, did you, do you have a concern at all about putting a cap uh, on, or do you think that there's a need to put a cap of the money to go, that's going to an individual employer? Just the idea behind that would be that there'd be, you know, making sure all the, you know, tiny little employers would also be able to have a ch uh, chance at this before maybe a handful of the larger ones would be able to soak up a lot of that money. Representative Hicks. Yes, thank you for that question, uh, Representative Frederick. I will... Yeah, I will uh, direct you to line 2.9, or excuse me, 2.11, um, that really is about equitable distribution. That was really, really important to me because I know we have some big employers in our state and then we have, like we had testifiers today, some folks that maybe only support a handful of people. And so that was intentionally added to, to ensure that we do that and that the department does that. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Frederick. Uh, I, I'm just grateful that you had thought about that during the, your development of the bill. Thank you. Okay, very good. Next I have uh, Representative Coran. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Hicks, for bringing this bill forward. I know we've talked a lot about um, things uh, specifically in the disabilities field to figure out how we're going to just make some improvements and, and try to get this right. And um, we know that the direct support professional uh, profession. Um, it's certainly not a way to get rich, um, but we also know that uh, doing good work out of the kindness of our hearts, um, just it doesn't put food on the table. Um, and I've, uh, you know, in my capacity uh, in the disability services field, uh, most recently in human resources, um, I know I've had the, the talk with applicants um, sort of similar to that, um, but trying to explain the intangible wealth that comes from working in this field. And as feel good as that is, um, but it goes back to, again, very difficult to support one's family with um, intangible wealth. Um, so then I think about, you know, how do we show our priorities as a state? Um, what do we do with knowledge from our neighbors who aren't able to self-advocate? Um, and I think when we legitimize this work um, as a sustainable career, we're showing that we're listening, um, that we greatly value um, the right of our community members to thrive um, in the home of their choosing. Um, so I think this bill is, while of course it's not going to fix everything immediately, I think this is a really good, um, great interim step um, in the right direction to eventually get there. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Cran. Uh, uh, and I'm not seeing any other questions. A uh, couple things else I'd like to mention is, first of all, thank you for bringing the bill forward. It's getting at some very important things. Uh, one of the things I was wondering on the, in terms of the recruitment or possible suggestions in terms of the audit, the attestation, et cetera, is uh, this going to be where they apply and the money's put up front or they will apply and then the money is given to them based on actual expenses, receipts that they turn in? Uh, Director Grafstison. Thank you, Chair Fisher. Um, as the language is drafted right now, they would apply and the money would be given up front. That would be based on the number of employees that they have or current open positions of the dollars they are hoping to use to recruit. Um, and then there is the ability for the commissioner to go in and audit and make sure that those dollars were actually used in the way that um, the employer applied them for. Uh, thank you, and that's why I was looking at it. So looking at the audit may perform an audit up to six years after the grant. I know that uh, 
in other state programs they go in once a year after you know when it's awarded so it's i was thinking of maybe that area could be tightened up a little bit more instead of being as long as uh, six years afterwards is as long as they until they've exhausted the funds is coming in once a year and doing you know some kind of audit and taking a look i think that would help get some of the issues that uh representative baker was addressing there uh not seeing any other comments or questions uh, Representative Hick, uh, Hicks, would you like to make uh, closing comments and renew your motion on House File 813? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, members, for hearing this bill. Uh, when I was 16 years old, a friend's mom was a supervisor at a group home and said, we need young people who are, have a lot of energy. Do you want a job? And I was open to that conversation, and I started working at a group home, and I fell in love. And I supported people in a variety of ways um, while I went to high school, while I went to college, while I started my professional career and continue to work there. I have been with people through all variety of life events. And I have cared for the same individuals from the time they were teenagers until they were grown adults. I've been with them when their parents have passed. I've celebrated birthdays. I've had them come to Vegas for my wedding. <laughs> and I have enjoyed every second of it. And the amount of money that I earned, you could drop a pin at. But what I gained was life experience and a passion that has carried me through. And I bring this bill today because I want all of the people who just started in this field and who are gaining that life experience and feeling that joy to also feel that they are valued. My dad always said, you can always see what someone's priorities are if you look at their checkbook. And I look to all of you today to ask what you prioritize and what does our checkbook show? And I thank you so much for hearing this, and I move my motion to move House File 813 to Human Services Finance. Representative Hicks renews her motion to refer House File 813 to the Human Services Finance Committee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. The motion prevails, and House File 813 is referred to the Human Services Finance Committee. We are at the end of our agenda today. Uh, our, our, our progress going forward this week on Wednesday, we'll be hearing House File 1043 from uh, Representative Hicks. Uh, Representative Hansen will be uh, presenting to us House File 1067. And then we're also gonna be having a presentation on the Indian Child Welfare Act from the Department of Human Services. Because we're gonna be having some bills coming out in that area. We wanna make sure that we've got the grounding happening on that. Have, are there any questions from either side? Hearing none, we're adjourned. Thank you all for a good day.